Welcome everyone to this edition of History Revealed. We're so pleased to have our guest presenters tonight. But before we get into that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter Ratcliffe from the Eastside Freedom Library to say a few words and then I'll do an introduction and then turn it over to our presenters. Peter? Thank you, Robin. And again, welcome everyone. Um, this is a great uh, year, uh, the 100th anniversary of the Women's Suffrage Amendment. And I think it's provided us with a window to look at many related issues uh, from the importance of voting itself to the presence of women in American politics to women's political activity beyond uh, voting. Um, we're very glad to be working with our colleagues at the Ramsey County Historical Society. Uh, we're excited for their exhibit to open next week um, virtually. Um, I do want to just mention that if you're hungry to do something in person, um, we are actually having part of an outdoor art show on our lawn. Um, I appreciated having this event to do tonight because it got me back inside because it's very cold out there this evening. Um, but Friday evening and Saturday afternoon and evening, um, there will be music and art. Uh, in what's being called the Solidarity Street Gallery. Um, Payne Avenue and related uh, thoroughfares uh, marking uh, what happened to George Floyd and the rise of the struggle against racism in the United States and the uses of art uh, to address that. So art and history are very important parts of what we do at the Eastside Freedom Library. And if you don't know much about us, I encourage you to visit our website, learn more about what we're doing, um, get involved with our work. Um, Robin, I'll turn it back to you, thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you to everybody at the Eastside Freedom Library. We've been partners with the presentations for the Eastside Freedom Library for almost three years now. And we're so honored to be able to do that and present tonight's program. We'll also be presenting upcoming programs in conjunction with our upcoming exhibition that Peter mentioned. It's on women's suffrage in Minnesota called Persistence, Continuing the Struggle for Suffrage and Equality, 1848 to 2020. It will be premiered online next Thursday evening at eight, no, excuse me, October 8th at 6 p.m. And you can see on our website at www.rchs.com uh, where to sign up. And you can check that out as well for upcoming programs on suffrage and a lot of other topics. And please consider supporting the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Eastside Freedom Library. We both are nonprofit organizations. We rely on your support to do programs like this. And there are benefits to joining. And again, those websites are on the slide on your screen. RCHS is committed to presenting the stories and histories of everyone in our community, and we are so pleased to be able to bring you tonight's program on suffrage. And I'm so excited to introduce tonight's speakers. Stacy Taranto is an associate professor of history at Ramapo College of New Jersey, where her teaching and research is focused on post-1945 U.S. political and women's history. She earned an AB in history from Duke University, and an AM and a PhD in history from Brown University. She is co-editor of the new collection, Suffrage at 100 Women in American Politics Since 1920, which came out just recently from Johns Hopkins University Press. And um, her first book, Kitchen Table Politics, Conservative Women and Family Values in New York, won the 2017 Arlene Custer Memorial Award. Stacy is also the article of several other articles, and her popular writings and commentary have appeared in Nursing Clio, The Atlantic, Time, and Made by History at the Washington Post. Leander, Leandra Zarno is an associate professor in the Department of History and affiliated faculty in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Jewish Studies at the University of Houston. She is a specialist in modern U.S. women's political legal and intellectual history with additional interests in media and transnational studies. Her first book, Battling Bella, The Protest Politics of Bella Abzug, was published in 2019. 
And as we mentioned, she is the co-editor of Suffrage at 100. And both Stacy and Leandra will be featured in a full series on the She's History podcast. Leandra is also co-directing an exciting digital humanities project on the 1977 National Women's Conference with a website coming up in March. And she is also a commentator on women in politics and has appeared in media outlines, outlets, excuse me, such as Time, The Washington Post. Thank Axios. you to Jim Bear and Danny, as well as filmmakers Tom Ryder, Donnie Koshio, and Will Stock for sharing those powerful stories and confluence of those histories. Their words remind me of the importance of finding a connection to the natural. Turn off your microphones, thank you. <laughs> Let me do that again. Um, Leandra is also a commentator on women in politics. She has appeared in media outlets such as Time, The Washington Post, Axios, The, H the Houston Chronicle, and Houston's NPR, Pacifica Radio, and PBS. So I'm going to turn it over to Stacy and Leandra. Thank you. Thank you so much for this extremely warm welcome and invitation. We're excited to speak with you this evening. Thanks to Robin and Peter uh, as well. And um, so I think that where we'd like to start, maybe the first question that we'd like to consider. Um, I don't know if Peter, if you wanted to ask that to us or if you wanted to just kind of launch in here. Well, it, why don't you guys go right ahead? Okay, so I think what we'll do is we'll start talking about, um, you know, women in politics since 1920. Why are we drawing focus to this, um, this issue? You know, obviously we're not fully at gender parity. Um, so how do we regard this centennial? And, and so I think uh, one thing that's really important is that um, a lot of focus during the suffrage centennial has been on what, what got us to 1920, what got us to the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, which really was an over 70 year struggle. And so understandably, there's this attention um, to the march to suffrage. But Stacy and I in our book, Suffrage at 100, are in fact focused more so on the march from suffrage. So what happens after 1920? And one thing that we really wanna make clear is that um, it's, suffrage is important. Voting is really important. So vote in November, um, but political power is important too. And political power moves mountains more quickly, um, you know, potentially. So, you know, one story about how women got the vote has really dominated our public memory um, since 1920, and it's because it's centered on two towering figures, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I mean, this is to the point that my grandfather, who collected coins his whole life, you know, the minute that I got my PhD, gave me a full collection of um, the Susan B. Anthony dollars. Uh, so, you know, this, I think, is important to focus on these figures, but um, they really wrote their own story. And so that's one of the reasons that we placed them at the center. They wrote multi-volume um, histories of women's suffrage. So one thing that historians are trying to do um, at the centennial and um, Stacey and I are really um, focused on is to broaden the story past uh, Anthony and um, Stanton, not to displace the significance of them, but to bring more players into the, um, into the, the fold. Uh, you know, new immigrants, women of color, poor women who were also out there with their pickets, um, you know, to get to suffrage. But also, if we're thinking about the after part, um, you know, not just women who are running, but all of the women who were involved in politics. Um, so we really want to draw focus um, to this question of why has it taken so long for women to move from voting rights to political power? Stacy. Yeah, and one of our biggest interventions in this book that we're trying to draw focus to is what we call the enduring white male political leadership ideal. I mean, our democracy was built with a lot of rhetoric about equality, but in large part, it really was just that rhetoric. Right? Like this was a democracy built for and by mostly white men of means. In many states, um, you know, only men, white men with property could initially vote. Um, and, you know, the, an exception was my state of New Jersey where women could briefly vote, but that was very quickly taken away and order was restored. Um, so, you know, that political legacy of having a democracy built with a white male political leader and voter in mind 
there were lasting consequences. And when the suffrage amendment passed 100 years ago, um, you know, you couldn't erase those consequences, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, we're, that's basically what we're tracking in the book. What mm -hmm. happens 100 years after that amendment in a system that was built to exclude women? Mm -hmm. So the voting piece um, certainly matters, but what we're trying to focus on is that there was a two-pronged fight after 1920 to actually, you know, um, implement that voting power um, and to move it to true uh, political power. So first, women who could vote um, initiated a series of campaigns to try to gain office and to gain representation in um, all of the major parties. Um, but second, and I'm going to um, focus on this, and then Stacy will get back to that first point, um, women of color and their allies uh, really had to, um, you know, keep keep the coal to the fire um, because 1920 did not actually, even though in principle, um, the ratification uh, of the 19th Amendment gave um, the vote to all women, in practice, it absolutely did not. Um, so women of color and their allies led a broad-based mobilization uh, aimed at universal women's suffrage that really didn't um, come into play until the 1965 Voting Rights Act. That was the real achievement. So just to give you a sense of this, Native women, Native American women, indigenous women did not gain the vote until 1924 with the Snyder Act. Chinese immigrants were barred from voting until 1943, Japanese Americans until 1952, and Latinas and African Americans throughout the South especially faced a white primary, um, you know, that was in place until the 1940s when the Supreme Court, um, you know, basically outlawed that. But still, even after that point, there were numerous procedural roadblocks um, to the ballot. Uh, and so I think it's really important to remi remind ourselves of the words of Dorothy Height. She was the president of the National Council of Negro Women, and she underscored in 1965 the following, um, just a really powerful quote to draw focus to right now, which is 50 years women, 50 years ago, women got the, um, got suffrage, but it took lynching and bombing the civil rights movement and the Voting Rights Act to get it for black women and black people. And I really think that Stacey Abrams is carrying on that, um, that fight and recognizing, you know, now that since Shelby V. Holder, this 2013 um, uh, decision that really undercut the Voting Rights Act, we're back at this position of um, rolling back uh, the, the right to suffrage, new ID laws, closing polling places, all the hoopla around mail-in voting, we really see this um, happening today. So now, back to that first prong. Yeah, so for women of color, the suffrage amendment did not do anything um, immediately. But for white women, they could go to the polls starting with that suffrage amendment in states where they already didn't have that right. Um, and, you know, like I was saying, you know, our main idea about this being a democracy that was set up by and for white men and always it was built on sort of a white male political leadership ideal. Um, it's important to note that, you know, these men who set up the American democracy, the only women they really thought about at the founding of the nation were women like their wives and daughters, other, you know, white wealthier women. And they, um, the idea was those women don't need the vote. If they want to have their ideas represented in our democracy, their husbands will vote for them. Or even better, they can raise their sons to do their bidding, to become the next generation of leaders um, in the mold that their mothers wish them to be. Uh, of course, you know, for poor women and women of color, their sons were not meant to be the next generation of leaders. Um, so in other words, white women, their politics were always very much historically intertwined with motherhood. So these women get the, you know, the 19th Amendment passes and these women can go to the polls. But again, that history isn't erased. They're, they're seen as political citizens um, through that lens of domesticity and motherhood. So it's really no surprise that they struggled to translate voting power into political power. You have to remember that 1920 is in the midst of a red scare. So women with the new vote, if they were to, you know, run for office or march up to Capitol Hill or to other legislative bodies asking for equality, any form of equality could very easily be um, shot down as communism or socialism in a red scare. 
Um, so it's really no surprise that one of the only le pieces of legislation, major pieces of legislation at the federal level that was passed in that first decade with the vote was something called the Shepherd Towner Maternity and Infancy Act that provided federal funding to states to try to combat their very high maternal and infancy mortality rates. Um, and again, women, you know, with the vote, they went up to the hill and they basically said, we have the vote, we're women, all we care about are mothers and babies. Men were predisposed to see them and believe that. And they said, you know what, now that we have the vote, if you don't pass this, maternal, this Maternity and Infancy Care Act, we're all going to vote you out of office. Now, of course, men as a gender block had never voted, you know, all men voting the exact same way. But the fact that a lot of men on Capitol Hill believed that all women wanted this legislation related to motherhood passed, you know, which goes contrary to all kinds of political science data that they would vote as a gender block. It really shows just how women were thought of as outsiders, right? Like the typical voter does not vote in a gender block, but of course women will do it because they're not real voters. Their primary um, affili affiliation is motherhood and domesticity. Um, so, you know, you, you really saw that. I guess it's no surprise. One of the authors in our collection, Catherine Parkin, she writes about widows. Um, actually, they're running as a widow was so common that one reporter at 1925, he, he said, just now a dead husband is a better ticket to Congress than a log cabin. And that quote is um, also the sort of part of her title of her article in, in the story. Um, you know, it really up until the 1940s, about half the women who ran for Congress were only there because they took their dead husband's seats. So again, women are thought of in terms of family and domesticity. And so the only time we're going to vote for them is when they're there to represent their family and their, their dead, the dead, dead patriarch in their family. So we're happy to tell you a little bit about how we um, came about writing this book. Uh, you know, we met uh, as graduate students in Columbia University's reading room, and I was working on my biography of Bella Abzug, and Stacy was working on her book Kitchen Table Politics, which I'll let her talk about in a second. Um, and we just happened to be looking in the same basic boxes and realized, oh, we're interested in similar types of um, history and politics. And, um, you know, we continued to talk with one another over the years. This was in the early 2000s. And so um, Stacy sent me a text in 2018. And we were just kind of curious about how so much of the work that we had heard about in um, in the works around suffrage, uh, you know, didn't really deal with this aftermath, this period of what happened next after 1920. Uh, so Stacy, would you just mind for a moment to talk just a little bit about your first book and what it entails and then we could think of talk about how they're connected. Yeah, sure. So I was I was at Columbia because I was looking at the papers of Bella Abzug, whom Leandra was writing about. Uh, her office, as Leandra knows, they had the foresight to save all correspondence that came into that office. And I was specifically looking, I was studying anti-feminist women. So I was looking at how in the 1970s, the Republican Party shifted from support of feminism um, high profile Republican governors like Nelson Rockefeller supporting things that Republican governors would never support these days like legal abortion in 1970 in New York State. And um, I was looking at how the party shifted from that to becoming in a party of so-called family values that eschewed all support for feminist policies. So I was specifically looking at some of the women that helped shift the Republican Party from feminist to anti-feminist. And a lot of them, of course, um, taking guidance from Phyllis Schlafly, perhaps the country's leading anti-feminist in the 1970s. Some of you may have watched the recent Hulu series, and if you haven't, you should, um, mm -hmm. on Schlafly called Mrs. America. I actually interviewed Phyllis Schlafly for my graduate dissertation turned first book. But, you know, she would write these talking points about why feminism was um, terrible and uh, going, you know, communist and everything. And women would then take those talking points and write to feminism feminist legislators like Bella Abzug. So I was looking at some of that correspondence in the archive when yeah. I met Leandra. Mm -hmm. 
And so Stacy's looking at um, conservative women through the lens of Bella Abzug, who's the most radical, you know, um, progressive in uh, Congress, you know, that era's AOC. And I'm looking, um, reading about Phyllis Schlafly in one of her biographies. And, and what jumped out at me was, oh my goodness, uh, Phyllis Schlafly ran for Congress in 1970 using the same exact slogan uh, that Bella Abzug did. So Schlafly's in Illinois. Abzug is in New York City. They're both using the slogan, a woman's place is in the house, the house of representatives. So essentially they're both running for Congress at the same time on a gender parity platform. Um, and I thought that was extremely striking. So, you know, Stacy and I have been talking about that a lot over the years. How is it that there's these uh, women across the political spectrum that have a fundamentally similar um, goal? They have a common denominator uh, you know, across the partisan divide, and that is gender parity in politics. That is the interest of um, no longer being the doorbell pushers of um, politics. So we were really interested in exploring that ideological diversity in, in our collection. Um, and so we have, you know, um, two uh, articles on um, Jean Kirkpatrick, um, you know, the first uh, woman, um, you know, under uh, President Reagan, um, who gets into the cabinet, um, you know, within the Republican um, Party. Uh, certainly, we have to think about Frances Perkins in the 30s as well um, on the Democratic side, but really an important role for foreign policy, um, you know, and then we also have an article on Louise Day Hicks and um, the career that she had in politics. Um, so you might know her from the anti-busing uh, movement, um, but, you know, these kinds of parallels are really interesting and we wanted to explore. Um, Stacey will tell you about a few other themes in our book as well. Yeah, so, you know, it was, it was like uh, this whole book started in 2018. And for historians, you know that two years from coming up with an idea for a book to publication is like lightning speed and academic publishing. But it was the summer of 2018, and I had just finished my first book. And Leandra was um, closing in on the end of her book on Bella Absog. And so, yeah, we wanted to write about women across the political spectrum. And I realized, oh, in two years from now, it will be the centennial. What a perfect occasion to try to take stock of women's fight for greater inclusion in the body politic across the political spectrum. And, you know, this is the summer of 2018 and a year after the Women's March. So there had been and the Me Too movement. Of course, that summer, there was a ton of political coverage. I'm sort of a political news junkie. And there was a ton of coverage about the historic number of women running for office, which became the historic 2018 midterms that November. So I thought, you know, wow, in two years from now will be the centennial, a perfect moment to take stock. It's also an election year. Who knows, maybe this momentum from the, um, from the midterms will carry over with a woman on the ticket again in 2020. Uh, sort of right, right? She's in the <laughs> second spot. Um, and so I just thought, what a great, uh, I, we should really take, um, you should really take stock of this and what better way to do it than through a collection where we can hear a broad spectrum of stories and voices. Mm -hmm. So many, so there's about 20 some odd essays and they're all brand new. Uh, so these are stories that have been actually untold. Um, and one of the areas that uh, we think is really important that uh, we draw attention to in this, in this collection is commemoration activities. And so one essay by Claire DeLahey, for instance, looks at the National Women's Party's efforts after 1920 immediately to preserve suffrage. So they had pageants, they were trying to create monuments, um, you know, and, and having birthday parties for uh, Susan B. Anthony and, and, you know, this kind of thing. Um, and that is connected even to 1970s when uh, another author, Anna Stevenson, talks about Ms. Magazine. And one of the main features actually in uh, Ms. Magazine was women in politics. Um, so, you know, remember, for instance, Mrs. America, or um, Mrs. America, Wonder Woman is who I'm thinking up on my shelf here, uh, was, uh, you know, the second uh, issue, um, the cover, and it said Wonder Woman for President. Uh, they had a lot of features on lost women's history and on the suffrage 50th in 1970. Uh, and then Monica, Monica Mercado in the latter part of our collection talks about the recent controversies surrounding suffrage monuments and memorialization. Um, and, you know, just even recently, um, there was a new monument uh, placed in Central Park, the first one that has 
uh, woman in um, in central in Central Park, and initially it was supposed to be just Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but there was a mobile grassroots mobilization to say, no way, we're not going to have a whitewashed monument out there um, to basically set the tone for what a gendered uh, landscape should be like. And so there's late edition of um, Sojourner Truth. So just a small fact is that, you know, of the five, over 5,200 historical statues there are, less than 8% are women. So one of our authors, Monica Mer uh, Mercado, talks about this as a bronze ceiling. Um, so we have like a lot uh, in our collection that actually um, get into the territory historians don't typically like to do, which is recent history. And Stacey's going to tell you a little bit about that section of our book. Yeah, so I, I think probably those are the two really big distinguishing features of this book, um, the, our focus on commemoration politics, as Leandro was saying. And we also have one of, I think, um, the largest treatments of recent political history, uh, that is uh, women's history in the 21st century. I know I teach courses that are modern history courses, and I often struggle to find something that an actual historian has written about something in the 21st century. I usually have to rely on journalists' accounts of, say, the 2008 or 2016 presidential elections. And those are fine, but of course, when you're teaching a history course, you'd like to teach something that is grounded in the discipline of history and is grounded in um, good historical archival work and such. So we have one of the first takes on the 2008 presidential election. Sarah Palin, of course, um, making history as the first Republican woman on a, on a major party ticket as the vice presidential pick of John McCain. And of course, we even have an article um, by Nicole Eden on uh, 2016 and how specifically a lot of women were white when they went to go vote for what they thought was going to be the first woman president because of course suffragists were white in there and their protests. Hillary Clinton herself accepted the nomination while wearing white. Um, so we have a really great article about that. And the piece on 2008 also covers the Clinton's um, 2008 primary run that was unsuccessful. And it's Emily Suzanne Johnson who writes about 2008. We also have, um, a lot of, we have a lot of history that foregrounds some of the big battleground states in this upcoming election um, and draws focus to it. We have an essay by Nancy Beck Young, a colleague of Leandris, and she is looking at mid-century skirmish, uh, skirmishes around free speech and education in Texas. So, you know, I think right now we're seeing Texas as a, as a battleground state and the work of women on the ground and her piece helps to foreground that current history. We also have a great piece by Ellen Refshoon, and she is actually looking at Georgia, profiling um, the diverse range of women who ran in the recent 2018 midterms and trying to put that and historical perspective. So I think it's really, um, it, it, that we see as a huge strength, putting some of these trends and all this talk about women in politics today in historical perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another thing that we're really trying to do is um, highlight new voices that we often don't hear about. Um, and so, you know, we're talking a lot at now about the Latino, Latina vote. Um, and Maricela Chavez, uh, one of our authors, draws focus to the how little we know actually about Mexican American women's voting legacy and political legacy. And so um, she's actually making a call for more history to be written. Uh, but in the process, she draws our focus to some biographies of people that we just don't know. And um, one person, for instance, uh, that was very instrumental in New Mexico in the Republican Party is Adelina or Nina Otero Warren, um, who was the first Hispanic woman to run for the House of Representatives in 1992. Uh, she was also the superintendent of the schools. And so one trend actually in um, women's political history is that school board has historically been the way, um, the access point for women in politics in those local offices. So I think that's really um, interesting and important. Uh, Dean Kotlowski is another author of our um, that's collected in, in, in this collection, and he draws focus to the work of Mary Elizabeth Switzer, who was a New Dealer, very high up in the Federal Security Agency. And so there's a lot of women in government, even though they're not necessarily in office. And this work is important because it's part of, um, you know, bringing LGBT voices into um, political history. And I think that a lot of work needs to be done in that area. 
Um, so those are a couple, uh, you know, in the early section um, of what happened in the 1920s through the 1950s that we're um, drawing focus to in, in this book. Um, and then Stacey will tell you a little bit about Holly Geis' work as well. Yeah, we're really excited to have um, a wonderful essay by Holly Mohawk Guys that talks about Native American women and some of their contributions to politics over the past hundred years. I mean, often the story of women from some of the 500 um, tribes that were indigenous to what becomes America, often it's sort of um, a defeatist history that's told. Uh, in a lot of um, tribes, women actually exercise great amounts of power, right? A lot of them farm the land and they inherited land themselves and passed it down to their daughters. They were also very influential in a lot of religious ceremonies. And of course, all that gets taken away from them, you know, in the name of civilization. Women should not be this powerful and you must be Americans and that means you must tend house and you must go, um, you know, sort of be put in your place, right? Um, so what Holly, uh, Holly Mohawk Guides' piece points out is she really highlights some women um, in, um, in Alaska who helped pass uh, a civil rights bill in, through the Alaska State Senate in um, the 1940s. And you know, that's really important to show that just because you know, a lot of the power at the tribal level was taken away from women that you know, they may have put on a show of sort of getting in their right place, but they were very much on the forefront of fighting for women's rights and the rights of um, others like them. Yeah, and a lot of, um, in the middle section of the, the book, a lot of focus is put on the 1970s. And so we, we hear a lot about the year of the woman um, as if it's a new trend um, in political reporting, but actually in the 1970s, there was a special issue on women in politics in 1972 actually, and they had um, this whole kind of special section on, on uh, women in politics and the whole first paragraph talks about is this going to be a year of the women or is this not going to be a year of the women? We'll see. Um, and Bella Abzug was the, was the cover, you know, shot for that particular issue. Um, so we have a lot of biography, uh, you know, focused in our section on the 70s and some of the, um, you know, people that are featured, you'll, you, you hopefully have become a household name. So a great article on Shirley Chisholm. Uh, and, you know, her march to the, um, you know, the presidential run that she did in 1972. Um, but perhaps you haven't heard about Patsy Mink, and so Stacey's going to tell us a little bit about her. Yeah, we have a great article by Judy Sushen Wu, and she talks about Pat Patsy Takamoto Mink. She was a third generation Japanese American woman from Hawaii. She broke many um, barriers just in becoming a lawyer, and then she entered the state, state government in Hawaii. And she was actually the first woman of color, elect and as well the first Asian American woman elected to the U.S. Congress. She was elected to the House in 1964. She arrived just in time to vote for the Voting Rights Act uh, the following year. And she was involved in the creation of the National Women's Political Caucus. She was very much, um, she was often um, right there on the Hill pushing for a lot of the important legislation that passed for women in the 1970s. And she actually ran for president that same year that Shirley Chisholm did in the 1972 Democratic primary. And, um, you know, although that's not the exact focus of the article, it does, it does put emphasis on that. And we think it's important, just as important to highlight some of these stories of women who weren't successful, but who broke important barriers in their day. Yeah, absolutely. So on that note, Joanna Neu uh, Newman, um, her great article, I'm just looking at the title here, Money's on the Mayor. Uh, focuses on uh, Hannah, Ruth Hannah McCormick, um, who is the first woman to, you know, make a not so successful run for Senate, but a really important one. Um, and so that was in, you know, the period of the 30s. Um, so that's one to think about. But then also think about like all of the women who tried to vote, but just didn't have that access point. So Liette Gidlow reminds us in a really, I think, very powerful um, essay in this collection of the thousands of American women like someone like Susie um, Fountain of Phoebus, Virginia, who attempted to vote after the ratification. And there were thousands of um, people who showed up for the polls 
uh, and we know this from newspaper clippings and voter registration records. And I know that there's a lot of local drives to actually write the biographies of, of these women. In fact, in, um, in uh, Harris County uh, in Houston, there's been a local drive by the Art Historical Society to write the you know, 2000 plus um, biographies of, of these women. I think it's really, really important to do that, uh, do that kind of work. Um, so we're hoping that our collection encourages more scholarship um, and you know more research in a grassroots kind of way um, as well about uh, about women in politics. That's one of the purposes of our book is to help redefine how we think about women in politics and history. You know, so often we uh, we miss women in politics because the presidency is treated as the holy grail, and um, so and Senate is the next you know is the next in line. Um, women have not sat behind the desk in the Oval Office and as a result have not been treated as major players in historical work focused on politics. Um, but this is changing and so we're extremely excited about how much there's been so much attention to the centennial and you know PBS has this great series on Lady Like 2020, a lot of like short films that you can watch about 10 minutes long um, that rediscover a lot of you know uh, women um, doing great things. New York Times actually called their, their series Suffrage at 100, so we'll, we'll lend them the title. Um, and so we were very excited to see the range of, um, of, of coverage that, um, you know, from biographies of people like Jovita Dar, who's, you know, known to Texas as a really important, um, you know, uh, woman sojourner, but now the, the rest of the nation knows about her um, through that work. But our concern is that after the centennial fades, the attention to women in politics fades, people will again shift back to treating women as peripheral play players. And so we really hope that the narrative of women in politics since 1920 is more than first ladies and more than some standout members of Congress. We hope that all of those coffee clutchers, and I know you're out there, you're doing this right now, the coffee clutchers, the phone bankers, the canvassers, the advisors, the lobbyers, lobbyists get recognized um, as political work. And sometimes what happens is that women's volunteer work, which is actually political, is seen just like volunteer work and that is it. Um, so we have to rethink about, you know, how we're tracing um, and, and considering what is political. And we hope also, though, that not only the women who win office, but the thousands more who tried and lost are traced out too. And so, you know, the 70s is, looms large in our book because it's easy to loom large in our book um, because so many in that moment were trying to um, very overtly move out of the back room of politics and work out front. Um, you know, but so we know that there's a couple, you know, thousands of women who ran for Congress, for instance, in those number of years. Um, but we want to know more about uh, not just Congress, but also the state legislatures, because actually in the state legislatures, there was an increase of about 50% between 1972 and 1974 or 282 um, seats to 437. So we're hoping that there's going to be a lot more people that join us uh, in this, um, this work that we're doing, uh, we think that women seem to be both everywhere and nowhere at the same time currently in political history, and we're hoping that that changes um, down the road. We're also really focused on gender parity, and so Stacey's going to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, uh, talking about the 1970s, you know, in the early 1970s, as all this legislation was passing and um, to try to give women more legal equality, and there were more women um, than had to that point ever been elected in their own right, not, you know, just on the widow track and such. Um, the National Women's Political Caucus was formed in 1971 in order to try, and one of their goals was to try to get 50-50 gender parity in politics. And the funny thing is, when they set that goal in, in 1971, they didn't even think that it would be hard to be at 50-50 gender parity by the centennial. Uh, you know, 2020 seemed so far away then. Well, of course, we know here we are in 2020. And if you look at Congress, again, just one metric, I mean, only about a quarter of Congress are women. 38% of those women are women of color. But again, um, you know, I think that sort of takes us back to that original argument, right? That, you know, 
it's very hard to translate voting power once everyone has it into real true political power and power sharing given this history of the of congress being of, i'm sorry of the american political system being built with really one ideal citizen in mind that of a white male so that history we're constantly um, confronting even to this day yeah, so historian Paula Baker says this well. She says that women were basically given a stool and not a ladder. Um, and I think that's just such a, I mean, it's kind of funny, but it's also kind of sad um, that, you know, basically they really had to push for the, um, the representation that they got. And so, for instance, the National Women's Political Caucus, one of their big wins, actually, um, in 1972 was to... Um, help push up the delegates, uh, the gender proportional representation of delegates at party conventions in the, in the um, Democratic Party it was a triple, triple jump uh, in that particular election and um, close to that, but not quite in the, in the Republican Party. So that kind of advocacy is really, really essential uh, in this particular um, process. Yeah, and I mean, um, you know, people always ask us, or it's sort of a question that naturally comes from some of this work, you know, what would be different if women were at full parity, you know, if we actually had 50-50 gender parity all across um, American politics at the various levels? And our answer is, I don't know, but I hope we live to see that. <laughs> I hope we live to find out. Because, you know, people will say things like, there's been exactly one spe female Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. She, regardless of your political affiliation, um, she's actually most people can agree she's been a very effective speaker in terms of getting the political agenda she wants um, through Congress. She's been very effective in that way. But you can't then extrapolate from that and say that women are great leaders, right? Because when the sample size is one, it's really hard to tell, you know, to make such claims. So we're hoping, um, you know, here we are in the centennial, centennial year in a country built on that white male political ideal. It's exciting that women are making greater gains than ever before. We're further than we've ever been, but we're not anywhere near 50-50 um, right now. Although it is very exciting um, right now in this presidential year that potentially, we've thought this before, uh, three other times, uh, that potentially a woman might break the, um, that glass ceiling of executive office this year. We have another shot um, with Kamala Harris as the vice presidential nominee. And we think that, you know, if she can be, if, if they are, if the Biden-Harris ticket is elected, um, it'll, it'll be great in terms, it could be really great. It could be a great opportunity in terms of trying to model what it is um, to have a woman at the highest echelon in American politics. It's a great opportunity um, that we hope won't be squandered if, um, if they were to win. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to jump in and sure. just ask a question and try to shift gears a little bit so that people can ask questions Perfect. before we great. run out of time. And, and I just wondered, I, I'm very impressed with the range of essays and the range of topics that people are exploring. And um, it's amazing how many of the essays are about women playing conservative roles. Louise Day Hicks, um, and certainly Phyllis Schlafly. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've heard a lot. I, I love as a historian, and I appreciated Stacy's point, she wishes more historians would write about more recent events. I, I love it for historians to try to engage the very present that we're living in. And um, we've been hearing a lot from uh, President Trump about uh, suburban women and uh, how important it is to him to gain the votes of suburban women. Um, and I wondered, given the subjects that you've both looked at in your own research and the subjects that you've explored with the contributors to the book, um, let's try to shift a little bit more towards the present and open the door. But I'd like to start by asking you, what do you think about this uh, sudden focus on, on suburban and obviously white uh, suburban women? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, Leandro and I actually have both written for, um, and some of your, some of the listeners tonight might be interested, the Washington Post has an excellent section that's called Made by History, and it's really a space for historians, those of us who normally just write for audiences within the academy, to weigh in on present day trends and try to give some historical grounding to those present day trends. There's actually an excellent piece just very, just came out today, but one of our uh, colleagues in the similar field, Michelle Nickerson, talking exactly about that. She's foregrounding the suburban women vote. And I'll say that, you know, this is not a new thing that Trump is, uh, that is, Trump is pointing to. This demographic of um, more affluent suburban white women, they have historically been a demographic that votes a lot. Um, you know, maybe if you're not working around the clock, uh, you know, if you, the wealthier you are, um, you tend to have more flexibility and the ability to get to the polls, right? If maybe you're not doing shift work or something like that. So this is the same demographic that really in the modern period, people have been going after since um, at least the 1960s when the Republican Party started to shift to the right and Republican strategists who would eventually find their way into the Nixon campaign realized we have to go after these suburban white women because they vote, Mm -hmm. (laughs) especially those age 45 to 64. And, you know, they've had different names through the years, right? Soccer moms. I think George Bush called them security moms. Trump is now um, making a bid for them. So um, yeah, it's not a new trend, but it, uh, you know, it, it makes sense to go after those people who vote. And I would definitely point um, interesting listeners to Michelle Nickerson's article today in the post of all things on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in our collection also, Melissa Estes Blair uh, writes a piece about how women were being courted as swing voters uh, in the 40s to the early 60s. And, um, and these are, some of those voters are those, those suburban women um, in the moment that the suburbs are crystallizing. Um, so this has been a long standing trend. We're happy for more questions. Yeah. If you have a question, please type it into the chat and we'll read the question out and Stacy and Leandra can answer that. That'd be great, thanks. And maybe you have another one for us, Peter. <laughs> well, um, I was in, in thumbing through the book, um, something that was in the back of my mind was that the first woman elected to the United States Senate um, was a member of the Ku Klux Klan, um, Rebecca Felton in, in 1922. I found in the essay in the book, I looked for Rebecca Felton in the index, and, and in fact, she was not elected. She was appointed uh, by the governor to fill out a term, and she didn't actually serve very long. But... Um, we had the opportunity to, uh, to do a conversation with Martha Jones. And, and with Martha, we talked about the issue of the so-called Mammy statue uh, that certain Southern congressmen, senators, uh, tried to have built at the United States Capitol in 1922. And, and so it just seems this fascinating way that the, the ink is barely dry on the on the Nineteenth Amendment, and already new lines of gender and race um, are being drawn. And I know that both of you, your work and your interests, tend to be later um, in the twentieth and into the twenty first centuries. But um, what do you think we can learn from looking at that kind of fluid period of conflict, redrawing boundaries, and right after the amendment is passed? Yeah, I think that's really great that you had Martha Jones. Um, she's an excellent speaker on this and her book Vanguard is, is a well worth read. Um, one thing that I think we draw a focus to in our um, first chapter where we're trying to map out what did the hundred years look like um, is just how fluid who came into Congress in those first years really was. Um, so if we think about the first women in Congress, um, that would be 1917. And we're looking at um, Jeanette Rankin um, from Montana and she's a leading suffragist. She really helps get the 19th amendment through. She's a pacifist. 
um, you know, very much different politics than um, the first woman that comes into the house after that, uh, who's Alice Mary Robertson, actually. So she's Republican from Oklahoma. And um, she's a huge proponent of small government. She opposed that Shepherd Towner Act that Stacy was speaking to a bit ago. And she's a huge supporter of the Jim Crow system. So she opposes anti-lynching legislation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, was very involved um, as well in um, this period. There's a lot of organizations, some that one, for instance, that comes to mind is called Patriotic Woman. Um, and the idea is small government, um, anti-communist or anti-radical politics uh, and, and trying to do away with uh, a welfare system that didn't really fully exist yet uh, in this period. And I, so ironically, uh, in the 1920s, the women that actually have the channel into the White House um, are the anti-suffragists who, who didn't want the vote in the first place, but then are right there uh, ready to, to use it the most effectively um, in that first decade. Which makes sense because, again, this is all happening in the midst of a red scare, right? So anyone who is um, putting forth ideas about racial equality or gender equality can more easily be called, as many of the leading suffragists were, you know, communists. Um, and so, you know, if you are just sort of your politics is shoring up, sort of heteronormative um, what will they be called the nuclear family and traditional gender roles, you're going to get um, more coverage, right? More of a space for that type of politics. So we have a question. The question is from Evan, and how is female representation at the state and local level? Does that bode well or ill for the future as a training ground for the bigger leagues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The state and the local level are the training ground and have historically been the training ground um, for access into other um, areas. And, and this is because, you know, party patronage has never really been um, something that women could depend on and fundraising has never been, or, you know, having a big well of um, backers with deep pockets has never been something that women can depend on, which is why organizations like the National Women's Political Caucus or, in, or today She Should Run and many others have tried to fill in the gaps that the party doesn't always offer. Um, so sometimes the access point to politics for women who just want to, you know, get out there on their own has really been those local offices. Um, and there's, you know, less um, difficulty getting, getting mentorship at that local level. Um, but they're not, you know, women historically haven't been slated for, you know, as a shoe in sure bet for um, take, taking on an incumbent, for instance. Um, and so that local uh, you know, groundswell of local politics has really been women's wheelhouse um, historically. And it's only um, in the results of the 2018 midterms that we've talked about Ellen Rafshoon's piece and that sort of centers on that. The pipeline's really growing at the local and state level, which is exciting because, you know, eventually that will sort of <laughs> make its way up is, is the hope, right? other questions put them in the chat and while we wait again I want to thank Stacy Taranto and Leander Zarno for this wonderful presentation I'm, I just got the book today so I'm really looking forward to reading it um, and we do have another question from James are there foreign examples that we can look to as a guide for greater representation by women well, yes, there's many foreign examples, including the example of just far north of us. I spent half my time living in Canada, and I would say that our you know, current um, Prime Minister Trudeau has really um, made uh, an appeal to having a 50-50 representation in his cabinet. Um, and so, you know, this is an immediate and um, close proximity example. Um, but something that, you know, Stacey and I didn't really get a chance to talk about, but the question that comes up a lot is, you know, will a woman in the White House matter? Um, and I think this too is important to look at um, in terms of global politics. And there's some political scientists who have tracked, um, you know, where in the world women have been able to get into positions of, pre of a presidency or a prime minister position. And what they've shown is that at least historically, it's been the case that women are able to ascend to those positions much quicker uh, in places that are um, middle powers or 
lower powers. Um, however, the United States being this, you know, at least at this point, the superpower of the globe, it's the hardest place to crack for women. Um, and so that, that relative relativity in terms of how much is the, how powerful are you and how powerful is the office, um, you know, determines if, if women have had trouble or, or not. Yeah, and, and you know, given the history we sketch out and given how powerful the US presidency is regarded worldwide, we really think then having a woman in the White House would matter, right? We um, expect that the change would be more about how we see leaders and how collect collaborative governance is approached than policy difference. Uh, we really hope that a woman in the White House could draw a focus more overtly to the barriers women have had to get there. Um, in the 2016 election, you know, Hillary Clinton had argued that her election would, quote, make history if she, in fact, had been, um, had been elected. And so we really just look forward to the day when a woman in history doesn't just, quote, make history, but instead, you know, shifts the course of how we think about politics itself. So we, we look forward to that day and um, reflecting on these past 100 years has only um, made that more true, I think. Yes. So, you know, we thought we knew what kind of story we were going to find. And so what's been sobering <laughs> is actually to look at, um, you know, the numbers in Congress, for instance. And so we figured out that um, in most, in most um, midterms since uh, 1920, women have re received a one or 2% bump. So they've ex increased in numbers by about that percentage. Um, there's been a couple exceptions. 1992 was one. So this is the, the swell of response to the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas mm. controversy during his nomination. Uh, and then there was another, which was 2018. Um, you know, and so that's been the other like historic swell that has happened. So the question is, will that continue um, or can there be setbacks? And so one thing that, you know, I was just floored by when I sat down and did the numbers, um, in, in this research, and I think Stacy too, was that at the end of the 1970s, so remember this is that year that the reporters kept saying, this is gonna be the year of the women. Now this next cycle is gonna be the year of the women, et cetera, et cetera. And different kinds, you know, new kinds of women came into politics. People like the Bella Abzegs and the Louise Day Hicks and the, you know, and the Shirley Chisholms came in, you know, well, Shirley Chisholm came in in the 60s, but she's running for president in the 70s. But in any case, at the end of the 70s, there are less women in Congress than there are at the beginning of the 1960s. Um, so it can be two steps forward and it can also be two steps back. This is not a progressive narrative necessarily. Given that history of, you know, it being a political system founded in the way that it was, right? But we're still hopeful. <laughs> hopeful realists. <laughs> Depending on the day, you know, with the news, you never know which way you're waking, which side you're waking up on um, these days. Is there any more questions? All right. Thank you again. Um, I just want to, I'm going to share in a second if I can get this to work. Our websites again. For everyone to write down, come and visit both of our websites, the Ramsey County Historical Society's website, www.rchs.com. You can find information on all of our programs and sign up for the October 8th online inauguration of our suffrage exhibition and the Eastside Freedom Library. You can learn about their art show that they're doing right now as well as their other programs at eastsidefreedomlibrary.org and we have copies of suffrage at 100 at our office and you can also check out our partner subtext books in oh there it is in downtown st paul um, they will also have copies of the books that you can pick up so again thank you all for watching i'm going to stop the recording if I might just plug for one second before the recording stops. So this podcast that uh, was mentioned by Rob and She's History is a wonderful podcast. And what they're doing is a full series of a, with a lot of the different authors from our book. So you won't just hear kind of more of the same from tonight, but you'll get to hear the stories, um, a lot of backstories, because, you know, the essays in this collection are rather short. They're great bedtime 
stories because they're about 10 pages, but you'll get like a full hour or so, you know, with, with a lot of the authors in this collection. Um, and so She's History, if you haven't checked it out yet, it's by Laura Borsma. Um, she's, you know, a producer in Hollywood who had a lot of summer time this summer and, and launched a, um, a new podcast and she has a whole series on Mrs. America as well. Um, so do check it out. We'll really appreciate it. Great. Let, let me just say too that this evening's presentation by Stacy and Leandra that Robin has said several times she's used the word recording. It's being recorded. Uh, the recording will stay available on the Eastside Freedom Library's Facebook and YouTube pages. I believe also Ramsey County Historical Society's Facebook page will make it available. So if you have friends who missed this tonight and you think that they would find it interesting, you can steer them to the Facebook and YouTube pages and they can still listen to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Thank night. You. Take care. Take care. Thank you. I'm going to stop recording. If you'd like to stay on for a few minutes um, and share some stories, um, we'll do that.